All right, segment five, climate and population, two quotations, Matt. The first comes from former Vice President Al Gore. I take a deep breath so that I can deliver this as well as he did. 2,000 scientists in 100 countries engaged in the most elaborate, well-organized scientific collaboration in the history of humankind, producing a consensus that we will face a string of terrible catastrophes unless we deal with global warming. Close quote. The second quotation from, comes from your own fine self in The Rational Optimist. Quote, the extreme climate outcomes are so unlikely that they do not dent my optimism one jot. Matt Ridley, how dare you? <laughs> well, uh, I think this is like previous scares we've heard. Yes, it's real. There's an element of, I mean, it, there's no doubt that our carbon dioxide emissions are changing the climate. Mm -hmm. But if you go into the science properly and examine it in all the details and you take what those 2,000 scientists are writing to each other and not what, what, they're be, what, what people are saying that they're saying, then there's no evidence that this is either accelerating uh, uh, at an unprecedented rate or that it's going to reach a very dramatic uh, level of warmth. Um, the, 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 the evidence to me is very persuasive that we have a high probability of a small warming and a low probability of a big warming. Now, actually, that's what those 2,000 scientists say. That's what the IPCC says. It just says we need to plan for that small probability. And that's where the argument is. And I, I perfectly accept that we need to have an argument about how small a possibility we need to take drastic measures for. I just think that at the moment we are um, rushing into measures that are doing real ecological harm and real economic harm. Biofuels would be a classic example which have minimal benefits even if we are facing one of these small probabilities of, of a catastrophic event. Uh, so I think we've just got to be very much more careful to look at the costs and the benefits. Otherwise, we might find in 50 years' time that we have, as I put it, put a tourniquet round our neck to prevent a nosebleed. You know, it, our it, neck, the round the neck of Western Europe and the United States. The round. Chinese will not put up with this for a moment. Well, that's well, another I, point, is that, uh, you know, I mean, in practical political terms, the, the idea of, of telling uh, two billion Asians that they can't use the route to prosperity that we used is, is unrealistic. Um, population. I said I'd like to return to population. Once again, the City Journal's Stephen Malanga, quote, Ridley mostly ignores the substantial problems that economists and demographers see in birth rates that have fallen below replacement level, notably a rapidly aging population, which creates an increasing dependence on pe of pensioners on a shrinking labor force, declining national productivity, and so forth. You note, he gives you credit, you note that in the United States, the population sinks during the 19th birth rate, rather, but then bounces back to replacement levels. Quoting Stephen Malanga again, but that equilibrium in the United States is so unusual that most demographers consider the United States a startling exception to the worldwide trends, close quote. Russia is dying, Europe is hollowing itself out, China will grow old before it grows rich. To which Matt Ridley replies. I reply that, well, at least we've got the argument away from panicking about population growth. And that is progress. Because, because 10, 20 years ago, and still in a lot of places, people go on about exponential, uncontrolled population growth. It ain't happening. It's slowing down. Population growth globally has gone from 2% to 1% in my lifetime. It's going to hit 0% sometime between 2050 and 2075 by the look of it. But, you know, things could change. So now we should worry, he's right, uh, about what that means in terms of a rapidly aging population in some parts of the world. And that is a, an issue. We're going to have fewer working people to pay for the benefits right. that support um, older people. Uh, but I, in a sense, I'm just simply saying that, yes, uh, the aging population and the declining birth rate are issues, um, uh, but they're a lot easier are to they, deal with than the exploding population we thought we were going to have to are deal with. We keep coming back, or I keep coming back to, if the news is so good, why is everybody whinging and whining so much? What? And I'm just wondering, is there, Mark Stein, for example, would argue that the low birth rate in Europe is tied to, reflective of, a loss of civilizational self-confidence. It almost seems as though there's an argument, but since it's occurring to me to, for the first time right now, I will yeah. probably put it in a ham-fisted way, that if only Europeans could all read The Rational Optimist... They'd have more, they'd have more children. <laughs> they'd say things aren't so grim after all. Do you think yeah. there may be something to that? I mean, you'd have to get at the Japanese, too, of course, because yes, yes, they, they yes. have an even lower birth rate in some ways. Um, uh, the, the, 
the, I, I'm, I'm not persuaded entirely that it's a loss of civil, civilizational self-confidence. I, I think, in a way, it's a sort of... Um, it, it's a sign of how comfortable we are about our individual futures that we don't feel we have to have lots of babies to support mm -hmm. us and lots of babies in case one dies and things like that. You know, so in, in some ways it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a sign of, of complacency, if you like, or, mm -hmm. or, or comfort. Matt, we're nearly out of time, alas. Here's my final question. Americans today are still reeling from financial crisis, recession, uh, quite learned journals are using the, new, the term the new normal, that we may have to get used to a much lower rate of economic growth, uh, the whole feeling that we may have to settle into, a, or that what, what happened to Britain in the 50s, mm -hmm. the loss of empire, that somehow or other China is eclipsing us in all kinds of ways. Um, if you could offer two sentences of advice to Americans and their leaders, what would you say? I would say openness. I, say, I would say the, 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 the secret is surely to uh, recapture what you've been so good at over the last two centuries, and that is to be open to the world, both in terms of people and ideas and goods and services. Um, that's what got you great, was openness within your borders and openness outside your borders. Matt Ridley, author of The Rational Optimist. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thank you for joining us.